From the Pittsburgh Ledger, PL Media, and The Drop, this is a podcast exploring the accountability murders in Pittsburgh. I'm Julia Page, and we're asking, who is no one? To the hypocrites and the corrupt, the swindlers, the parasites, all those who take from your fellow man, because like all monsters, you believe yourself safe in the shadows. This message is for you. No one is above the law, and I am no one. Hi, my name is Julia Page. I'm a reporter for the Pittsburgh Ledger. Welcome to the podcast. It's certainly an interesting time in Pittsburgh. If you're listening, you may already know about No One, Richard Rowe, the copycat killers. If you don't, don't worry. We'll walk you through everything. But to start, and to give you a bit more context, a big goal for this whole podcast, I I thought it might be a good idea to tell you a little bit about who I am, why I'm doing this. I grew up here in Monroeville, went to school at Duquesne, I covered high school sports when I was in college as a freelancer and interned at the Ledger over the summer when I was a senior. I started full-time at the Ledger when I was 25, worked on the breaking news desk for seven years until 2013. From there, I moved to crime for five years before I shifted over to sports. You know, where it only feels like life and death. Crime reporting is a specific type of journalism. If you're old school, you don't go anywhere without your scanners. It's just a constant background noise you're always existing in different codes for fire, police, ambulance. It's overwhelming at first. You're always straining to hear which code went out and cross-referencing it against your cheat sheets. After a couple weeks, though, you start to notice when they're not on. You see all kinds of things. Break-ins, robberies, stabbings, shootings, and of course, bodies. Unfortunately, there's a lot of death. Some of it makes sense. A lot of it doesn't. Once I showed up at a house on Tripoli in East Allegheny, police and paramedics had been called because a teenager shot and killed another teenager, someone he grew up with, for making fun of his haircut. We try to talk to witnesses, family members, but you have to keep in mind, you're asking someone hours after they've lost a brother or a sister, a parent, a child. Most people don't want to speak to someone like me. I never took it personal if they told me to piss off. No matter how many crime scenes I've been to, I've never experienced what they have. I hope I never will. But if I do, can't imagine I'd want to talk to a reporter. Still, you're trying to capture the essence of what happened, how this person died, but also how it's going to impact the people around them, the neighborhood, community, all of the ripple effects. A colleague reminded me the other day that you learn more about what's really going on in a city when you understand who's dying. I think there's some truth to that, but I think you also have to understand why. There's nothing more seismic to a community than murder. And understanding the reasons for it are as important as shining the light on the repercussions. Otherwise, how do we as a society change anything? That story I mentioned about the teen who killed another teen for making fun of his haircut, his name was DJ. He was 17 years old. It was what you call a house cut done by his mother because that month it was either DJ's haircut or a carton of ice cream for his younger brother's birthday. DJ didn't have much, and what little he did have was routinely taken from him by the bigger and stronger neighborhood boys that he wanted to believe were his friends. Yet they rode him all the time for his dirty clothes, for his mom being on public assistance. And that day, when they saw his house cut and decided to tease him about it, DJ snapped. He shot the teen with his uncle's gun. Did that boy deserve to die? Obviously not. But with context, we can begin to understand how these breakdowns in the social contract happen. It's not just a haircut that we're talking about. We're also talking about a lifetime of economically induced stress in an American city with rampant poverty and few answers on how to lift up its most disenfranchised. And to be clear, I'm not saying DJ should be let off the hook either. He killed someone. But I am saying you can't pretend the circumstances and the challenges he faced didn't play a major factor in how he got to that point. These stories are the norm. You can compartmentalize as best you can, find hobbies that fulfill you, which can help for a while. But for a lot of reporters, it's not sustainable. It wasn't for me. 
But it's vital work. I guess that's why I came back. And let's be honest, these Richard Rowe murders, what's going on now, these are the kind of social contract breakdowns that affect us all. Full disclosure, I wasn't keen on doing this podcast. There's already a lot of talking heads and personalities doing their own internet play-by-play, reaction videos, blogs. The idea of adding another voice to an already charged landscape, especially mine, I can't say it was very appealing. Unfortunately, our Metro editor disagreed. One of my top four best features. Disagreeing? Oh, you want me to say no, don't you? Okay, well, if that isn't the perfect way to introduce you. Also joining me on the podcast will be famed Metro editor of the Pittsburgh Ledger, Teddy Barstow. Teddy started as a crime reporter, too, before Metro, then investigative reporter. Now my paper boss. But only on paper. Thank you for talking me into this, Teddy. Look, to your point about adding another voice to a noisy landscape, I'd like to point out, plain and simple, that the landscape is currently filled with a lot of misinformation. And one of the things we pride ourselves on at The Ledger is our thoroughness, nuance, and when necessary, ability to speak truth to power. It's important as a publication of note to be an accessible, reliable source of information, especially in complicated times. And to meet people where they're at, even if that means embracing a new format. So really, it wasn't me disagreeing with you. It was more reminding you of your civic duty, Julia, and you are welcome. Okay. I think to kick things off then, I want to walk everyone through the timeline. It's hard to give context without context. Let's do it. The unofficial start of all this, at least as far as anyone has been able to show evidence for, goes back to May 1st, 2022. That's when the first video started circulating, emailed to web outlets, newsrooms, and papers. Simple black text on a white screen, animated, quote, no one can hide in the shadows, end quote. At the time, and I can say this from the ledger's perspective too, this wasn't something that registered outside of a few web outlets acknowledging that we'd all received this video within hours of each other. Newsrooms get threats and crazy gimmick statements all the time. So with no call to action or a manifesto or a statement of intent, it didn't really garner a ton of discussion. But it's still important to mention because it is the precursor to the command prompt website and the first threat. The site Teddy is referring to first went online in late May, 00110000.info, which is binary for zero. Don't worry, anyone who wants to explore it themselves will have a link in the show notes. Records show that the site was up for about two weeks before Danielle Gaines from Edge News wrote her big piece about it. Also a link in the show notes. Danielle was the only reporter in town who saw this strange sort of ominous email and decided to look into its origins. In the coverage, Danielle laid out the site as belonging to a digital activist who was calling himself No One. She claimed to have found him through her investigation into the source of an animated text video, which Edge News had gotten as well, chronicling her journey through dark web forums. She raised concerns that No One was planning significant accountability action in Pittsburgh, whatever that might mean. In the article, Danielle also provided the command line that she used to connect to No One's servers which we'll also have in the show notes. There you go. This is where the second video debuted on June 3rd. Just like the video sent to the newsrooms, this one had matching black text on a white screen. But now, there was also a voice. To the hypocrites and the corrupt, the swindlers, the parasites, all those who take from your fellow man, because like all monsters, you believe yourself safe in the shadows. This message is for you. I am in the shadows now with you, and I will drag you all out. A better world is coming where all monsters will answer for their transgressions in the light of day. No one is above the law, and I am no one. 24 hours later, on June 4th, no one posted his third video. Julian Cologne, sociopath, butcher. You played the role of healer, courted the vulnerable and needy, and then destroyed them to satisfy your perverse curiosities. 
You wear your wealth so proudly, as if it's your birthright, but your only legacy is withered bodies and shattered minds. You have one week. Tell the people of the world how many people you've ruined, the excruciating pain you inflicted, and the horrific ways you stripped them of their dignity. Or I will. No one. Dr. Julian Cologne was the CEO of Cologne Pharmaceutical, based in Pittsburgh. Dr. Cologne had turned his company into a leader in gene therapy and disease intervention. He wasn't a household name, but he was certainly connected in the city. Several online outlets reported on the threat, but this still wasn't something that gained mainstream attention. And then, seven days later... Documents released today on a website belonging to the digital activist No One alleged startling behavior by Dr. Julian Cologne. Allegations that Dr. Cologne knowingly ran a series of dangerous medical experiments, experiments involving the torture of inmates on inmates in the Puerto Rico prison system and exposure to radiation and toxic chemicals. Attorneys for Dr. Cologne released a statement denying the allegations in the strongest terms. It was suddenly everywhere. Dr. Cologne was confronted with a threat to his legacy, supported by handwritten notes that he claimed were not his. Fact or fiction, the data drop certainly damaged Cologne's standing and put his company's future at risk. Some might say that Dr. Cologne put his company's future at risk. The alleged evidence is, well, it's compelling at the very least. Compelling. At the time, unverified, but worth investigating? Not if you work in the DA's office. Okay, you're jumping ahead. Sorry, sorry. Let's talk about the next one, the entrepreneur. So, Julian Cologne was the first to have their lives upended by no one. The second target was a crypto billionaire named Edwin Lin, CEO of the popular cryptocurrency exchange CoinHole. On June 15th, no one issued another threat video through his website. Edwin Lin, liar, hypocrite. You preach from the gospel of collectivism, transparency, openness, but hide your true intentions. Your greed is ruining lives. You are pillaging the community. You have one week. Tell the people of the world how you're planning to steal from them and how much, or I will. Seven days later, the text messages, if true, paint a clear picture that Mr. Lin had knowingly run a fraudulent enterprise. These documents present more than just a challenge to Mr. Lin's legacy as a prodigy who rose to success in the world of digital finance and conspired with others to commit wire fraud and money laundering. And in a damning text exchange with Coinhole's chief technology officer, Lin debated the possibility of claiming that he was conned into running the scheme. They point toward willful criminal conduct. On July 1st, no one set his sights on a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, targeting a popular state senator. Noah Kemp, swindler, parasite. You railed against fiscal irresponsibility, rode a wave of anti-government contempt into office, cutting education and housing budgets, and then wasted no time in siphoning away the tax money of your constituents. You tell the world you are a simple man. At least that much is true. You are the most basic kind of criminal. You have one week. Tell the people of the world how much of Pittsburgh's money you stole and how you tried to ensure your closest friend would take the fall. Or I will. No one. Among the alleged evidence against Senator Kemp is an incriminating phone conversation between Kemp's chief of staff and the dean of Carleton University at Philadelphia discussing a plan. Corrupt shell university programs intended to act as holding entities nearly to funnel federal education funds into dubious state education programs. Split between the dean, chief of staff Gale, and Kemp. Kemp vehemently denies any involvement and has offered to testify on the record against his now former chief of staff. There is not one shred of evidence connecting me to Jim Gale's crimes, and they are crimes. A gross misuse of funds that, frankly, should be going to our children's educations. That last voice was State Senator Kemp. We're going to come back to him in a second. He has a bigger role to play in all of this. But first, there was one more threat from no one 
issued on July 15th to a prominent Pittsburgh real estate mogul and patron of fine art. Louis Capel, slumlord, murderer. You say your passion is giving back to the community. You spare no expense in your galas and filling out your galleries but you spare expenses to maximize profits in the construction of your buildings that are not safe. You have one week. Tell the people of the world about the people who died screaming and burning and how much money their death saved you. Or I will. No one. The documents show a history of cutting corners on building materials. It's like folders including contracts for electrical and plumbing work by companies on a do not hire list. Doctored permits covering up the use of banned synthetic building materials that made construction more cost effective, but led directly to an apartment fire that killed 10 and injured 9 more. And then, nothing. No more videos. No more threats. No more data drops. And perhaps most importantly, no investigations. This is the district attorney, Gary Foster, on August 1st, when asked about the allegations against all four of the no-one targets. At this time, we cannot verify the source of the information. Furthermore, I just want to point out, we are a city of laws. We are not a city of civilian justice. Then, on September 2nd, nearly three months to the day since the first threat. Copy that one nine. Take the call of a person shot, 1501 Squirrel Hill Lane. Time is 1837 hours on the clock. Show me en route. Anything further? Call reporting multiple shots fired, one person down, no description on the nothing further. On September 2nd, someone shot Dr. Julian Cologne four times in the chest at close range. He was dead before the police arrived. Dr. Cologne's neighbors called in the noise disturbance, initially slighting multiple explosions. At the scene, police recovered five shell casings. This was a detail they kept out of the press, though. More on that in a little bit. This cold-blooded murder shook the upscale Squirrel Hill neighborhood and dominated the news cycle. There were, honestly, a number of media members who were quick to the idea that no one was the shooter. One of the first headlines, and I won't name names, but one of the first headlines I saw literally read, no one finishes the job. But with no suspects and no concrete evidence to make the connection, the police initially treated this as an isolated incident. Until a month later, when Edwin Lynn was murdered in the same way. Four shots to the chest. His body was found in the alley behind the Fairmont Hotel, behind a dumpster with a message created by a shoe polish container turned into a marker tying the murder directly to no one's original threats. Tagged across the front of the dumpster were the words, held accountable, and right below a second tag, row. Alejandro Rios and I wrote about this back in October, but initially there was some confusion about whether police considered those tags related to the Lynn murder. However, after running the row name through databases of graffiti artists, as well as the database the city keeps of graffiti removal requests, detectives determined that it was most likely a part of the tag, possibly even a signature. And then, once ballistics matched the shell casings at both the Julian Cologne crime scene and the Edwin Lynn crime scene, further credence was given to the notion that these were probably related. The graffiti above Lynn's body that indicated he had been held accountable led several detectives to start calling the suspect the accountability killer. So now, there were two murders connected by the doxing and the threat videos. Edge News first reported on the Roe name, and internally, officers began referring to the killer by the full moniker, according to police sources, Richard Roe. Teddy, we don't know for sure why police started adding Richard to Roe, but where does the actual Richard Roe come from? Historically, it's been a placeholder name like John Doe that's used when the true name of a person is unknown or is being intentionally concealed. In the context of law enforcement, it's another name used to refer to a corpse whose identity is unknown. But Richard Rowe was very much alive and seemingly committed to holding the corrupt accountable, just like no one promised to do. Which might be why, in the wake of a second murder, no one released a statement on his platform publicly using the full name for the first time. Richard Rowe does not act for me. The corrupt may deserve violent retribution, but killing cannot be part of our process. We must not degrade ourselves by resorting to violent murder. 
So I fight to make the guilty confess, to hold them accountable in the light of day. We cannot let the dead take their secrets to the grave. I will not let Richard Rowe continue. We deserve better. With no one promising to stop Rowe and two more doxed targets out there, the city held its collective breath. Until the night of November 7th at the home of State Senator Noah Kemp. Hello? 911, what is your emergency? He's, he's here. Sir, what is your emergency? He's here in my house. Are you seeing there is an intruder in your house? Yes, yes, 1657 Hurry, please, it's Richard Rowe. No, 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 leave me alone! Sir, can you hear me? Ah! All units, take the call of a person shot, 1657 Time is 2042 on the clock. Multiple shots fired. No! Don't leave me! Please! You are going to live, Senator. Who are you? No one. Senator Kemp had decided, after Edwin Lynn's murder, that he wasn't going to take any chances. He purchased a bulletproof vest and wore it for weeks, at the office, in the car, at home. Senator Kemp was shot twice, the vest catching the rounds, but the force knocked the wind out of him. Senator Kemp, in his statement, said that the shooter got closer. He was wearing a mask, pointing a revolver at Senator Kemp's head, a thirty-eight Special. Senator Kemp said he was sure the next shot would kill him until no one intervened. What you hear towards the end of the tape... Which we should mention took us several months to get out of city officials. Just after that voice, that is Richard Rowe's escape. He shot the first two responding officers, delaying additional units from reaching State Senator Kemp's home, which also gave no one an opportunity to slip away. And I know what you're thinking. How do we know that this was the same no one? It's a good question. Technically, we still don't. It's a modulated voice and can be replicated. However, there is the website. And two days later, no one released another statement video. I said no one is above the law. I meant it. Richard Rowe sought to kill Senator Kemp, to rob us all of justice. This is not what our city needs. This will not heal us. I will not permit it. Not from Richard Rowe nor anyone else who wishes to pervert my cause. No one is above the law, and nothing is a substitute for justice. What do you think of no one? What's this for? It's a podcast. I thought you said you were a newspaper. We're trying something new. So have you been following what's been going on? Yeah, of course, since that pharmacy guy. Julian Colon. Yeah, that fucking snake. All that shit he did in Puerto Rico, he built that whole goddamn company off those people he hurt. Probably killed. So would you have supported an investigation by the district attorney into the allegations against him? Absolutely. But it worked out. Do you think that he deserved to die? I'm not saying, like... All right, let me ask you that in a different way. Even without the district attorney pursuing a formal investigation, do you think that Julian Cologne should have been held accountable? Wait, wait, all that stuff he did was true, wasn't it? The leaked documents have been verified, yes. Then, yeah. Same with that crypto guy and Kemp. They should be held accountable. I'm glad they were. It's an interesting thing to try to contextualize. Everyone named and targeted by no one and then killed by Roe has turned out to have quite the skeletons in their closet. After Dr. Julian Cologne's death, investigators were able to verify the majority of the documents that no one released. And the same happened with Edwin Lynn. I have a dozen interviews like the one you just heard. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but a lot of the people who chose to talk to me 
weren't broken up about what Richard Rowe had done based on the information that no one had provided. These people were monsters and they were guilty. They, quote, got what was coming to them, was something I was told off mic from more than one person. But once again, this brings us back to Senator Kemp. If you remember, and absolutely no worries if you don't, this has been a lot of information, State Senator Kemp was accused of a scheme to divert millions of dollars of federal grant money to his own programs through a nonprofit run by his wife, where Senator Kemp currently draws a $500,000 a year salary. No one released recordings of phone calls between Senator Kemp's chief of staff and the dean of Carleton University at Philadelphia. However, and this is where it gets more interesting, no outlet was able to verify Senator Kemp's direct involvement or knowledge of the allegation, a fact that is not lost on Senator Kemp, and one he doesn't want lost on anyone else either. Good evening. I'm going to keep this brief. The allegations against me are and continue to be fabricated falsehoods The actions of my chief of staff have nothing to do with me. But what I really want to talk about today is the targeted campaign of digital domestic terrorism that has led to an attempt on my life. We need to meet this societal threat head on and with force. If it can happen to me, trust me, it can and will happen to you. On December 15th, 2022, Police received an anonymous tip alleging that Richard Rowe was squatting at the Cary Blast Furnaces in the industrial town of Swissvale. The blast furnaces were shuttered in 1982 and are now a national monument. In the summer, you can take tours of the giant abandoned furnaces and the rusted out remains, but not in the winter. In the winter, they're empty. Now, an important detail to talk about is why the police took this tip as seriously as they did. The tip was sent in over email. It was four lines. Richard Rowe. The fifth shot is a blank, like a firing squad. And then it also included the Cary Blast Furnace address. What exactly did this mean? Well, circling back to what I mentioned earlier at the Julian Cologne crime scene, police recovered five shell casings, but there was no fifth bullet hole. The same thing at the Edwin Lynn crime scene. And like I said, this was a detail they kept out of the press. So for this anonymous tip to reference that mystery and possibly provide an answer for it, detectives took this information quite seriously and were quick to put together a raid of the building with SWAT. Oh, the last thing uh, to give context on about the five shots just before we move on. Sure. Uh, So the idea behind firing five shots with one being a blank, this is actually an homage to the five-man firing squads that were once used to carry out the death penalty, famously used in the execution of Gary Gilmore in 1977, which, if if you haven't read Norman Mailer's The Executioner's Song, then do yourself a favor and go take that journey. Now, it was customary in firing squads for one of the shooters to have a random blank in their chamber. It's often referred to as the conscience bullet because it allowed the shooters the knowledge that they might be the one firing the blank, which would hopefully help clear their conscience of killing. In this case, we now know that the murder weapon is a 38 Special, a revolver, which means in order to leave the casings behind, Roe had to pop out the cylinder and empty it, deliberately leaving the casings behind. Police now consider it a part of the Roe statement. Suspect is believed to be armed and dangerous. I wrote about this night. I have a feeling these are going to be long show notes. Ah, there's no such thing. Think of them as like liner notes that lead somewhere. At 8.16 p.m. on December 15th, police made a call to raid the Cary Blast Furnaces. Sometime after 8.25 p.m., they had captured the suspect alleged to be Richard Rowe. Located in the furnaces, police found a campsite along with a small gas-powered heater, a hot plate, food and medical supplies, and maps of Dr. Cologne's neighborhood, Edwin Lynn's office, Senator Kemp's home and neighborhood. They also recovered a mask with distinct markings, one that Senator Kemp later identified as the mask worn by the person who attacked him. Two eyewitnesses also reported a no one sighting at the furnaces. Now, Edge News also reported anonymous police sources who claim that no one actually left the Roe suspect restrained for officers. But no other outlet has been able to confirm that claim. Either way, what police did not find was a gun. 
And what they did not release was a name. Teddy, what do we know about that decision? Yeah, that one's still murky. For the first few days, they claimed to still be trying to identify him. But after a week and a half, it started to feel like they were withholding something here, which we now know is accurate. I've asked around, but what's come back, no one's quite ready to say whose call it was, but eventually the Roe name did come out. Aaron James Kern. Who is the son of Ben Kern, Assistant Chief of Operations of the Pittsburgh Police. Ben Kern is someone I've known professionally for a long time, 20 years. And I can say that as someone who covered his entire career, he is beyond reproach as an officer. It's one thing Ben has prided himself on at every turn, it's his reputation. Ben first made a name for himself undercover. In 2003, the ledger received information that an undercover officer had prevented an act of domestic terrorism planned by the Weiss Macht Brotherhood, a white supremacist gang. I was one of the reporters covering the story at the time, and what came out about the lengths Ben had gone, embedded eight months deep cover inside a violent white power criminal group, he was a hero. But during one of his final undercover acts, Ben was able to help stop the bombing of a mosque, but his cover was blown, and he was shot twice. After the RICO charges against the organization, Ben's undercover career was done. But he was a hero cop who didn't want to retire, so he rose through the police ranks politically. He became decorated, was respected, viewed to be the right kind of police. But what's on the outside seldom reflects the full picture. Since his son Aaron's capture and confession, we've had two copycat murders, four shots to the chest each. Both killers were caught, apprehended, allegedly in part by no one. But two nights ago, there was a new murder, Louis Capel, the last of the four names that no one originally doxed. With Aaron in custody awaiting trial, this would appear to be a third copycat, but this one is different. Teddy? So we can now exclusively confirm the report that there was a note at the Capel crime scene, I am the real Roe. And as the ledger also exclusively reported earlier today, ballistics on the shell casings match the original murder weapon, which was never recovered. Last night, that same weapon was used in two more attacks. Ben Kern was shot once before no one allegedly intervened. He's in stable condition. But three hours later, Ben's other son, Michael Kern, was shot four times in the chest. He was pronounced dead later that night. So, what do you think? Is that the right place to leave it? I think so. That's, that's a pretty informative first episode. And, and like you alluded to up top, that's really what we're, you know, looking to do here. Keep people informed while also chronicling the work we're doing at the ledger behind the scenes. I've never tried or done something like this before, but I agree with Teddy that it's important to meet people where they're at and embrace new media opportunities. We've walked through a lot of information today, but... I think for me, what the core of this boils down to is that there's a relationship between no one and Roe. No one committed the data drops. Roe committed the murders. Whether they're connected beyond Roe targeting no one's targets, that's part of this whole mystery. And this is why I ultimately agreed to do this podcast. Despite your feelings about no one, understanding the how and the why of him is important. But so is the who. No one claims that his identity doesn't matter, hence the name. But as we've talked about a lot today, context does matter. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And if you want to talk about accountability and stand for it, then you have to be accountable too. And what no one has opened up in Pittsburgh is something they need to account for, whoever they might be. Join us over the coming months as we work to find out who is no one. Before we go, just one more thing. We were originally going to talk more about the Kern family today, but with the current events, I want to take a minute to make sure we have our reporting right and to give a few people an opportunity to get back to us. That said, the Kern family holds a very prominent place in the existence of no one. We'll take a close look next episode. Until then, stay safe, Pittsburgh. To read more about no one, head to blackmarket.la. 
Who Is No One is produced in partnership with Black Market Narrative and ZQ Entertainment. Black Market Narrative.